Hi, welcome to my channel Cardiology and Beyond. I'm Dr. Sonali, an interventional cardiologist from India. Today's video is going to be about syncope and how to approach patients which come with symptoms of syncope or presyncope. Now this is a very confusing symptom in the sense that there can be a lot of different causes which lead to syncope. So let's get into it. So let's mind map today's topic. We're going to be talking about symptomatology under which we have syncope. As always, I have formulated a host of questions which will be tackled in this video. Now the reason I keep stressing about going through the questions first before going through the video is to help prime your brain to the kind of material that will be tackled in the subsequent parts of the video. Once your brain is ready to accept the knowledge by going through these questions, it will be much easier to understand the various mechanisms. So first off, what is syncope and what are its broad mechanisms? Now it is defined as a transient loss of consciousness and postural tone with spontaneous complete recovery. Now there are two main mechanisms that contribute to it. Number one is reduction in cerebral blood flow and number two is reduction of energy substrates. So the factors which contribute to a reduction in cerebral blood flow is either a fall in the central aortic pressure to the tune of less than 60 millimeters of mercury or an elevation in the cerebrovascular resistance or elevation in the intracranial pressures. Now there are two important energy substrates which contribute to the proper functioning of the brain parenchyma and it is oxygen and glucose. So when there is hypoxia and when it is severe enough, for example when the partial pressure of oxygen is less than 60 millimeters of mercury or when the saturation is less than 80% then it contributes to syncope. Secondly, Severe hypoglycemia to the tune of less than 40 mg per deciliter or less than 40 mg percent of sugar is present, it leads to reduction of this energy substrate to the brain parenchyma and contributes to syncope. What are the different causes of syncope? Now, not surprisingly, there are a host of causes which contribute to it. Right from neurally mediated syncope to orthostatic hypotension to cardiac causes, to central nervous system causes, to causes because of some metabolic issues or because of drugs and some unknown causes. Now in this video, I'll be talking mostly about these first two columns, which will include vasovagal or neurocardiogenic syncope, situational syncope, carotid sinus hypersensitivity, post-exertional syncope and orthostatic hypotension. In the next video, I'll be talking about the remaining causes which will include cardiac causes. Now, it is very important to take a thorough history of a patient who, who presents with syncope or presyncope because it will be very devastating if, for example, the patient comes with syncope and you assume him or her to have a cardiac cause wherein, in fact, in reality, he or she might be having, for example, an IC bleed. You end up giving some blood thinners, some anticoagulants and that can precipitate or worsen the IC bleed and can have devastating outcomes. What is the commonest cause of syncope in clinical practice? Now if you look at this listing, the most common is in fact unknown causes around 40% wherein you are not able to come to any diagnosis even with some extensive workup. And it might require recurrent workup in the future if the patient keeps having recurrent episodes of syncope. But by and large, the commonest cause is vasovagal or neurocardiogenic causes, which contributes to around 30% of the cases. This is followed by cardiac causes, and that is followed by central nervous system causes. Metabolic reasons or other medical conditions and drugs contribute to minority of the causes of syncope which we see in our day-to-day -day clinical practice. Now we'll come to one of the commonest syncopes that present in your cardiological practice which is neurocardiogenic syncope and what are the features of it? Now essentially they occur because of certain triggers and the triggers can be varied either an emotional stress or prolonged standing, dehydration, these are the operative words here. Prolonged standing, dehydration is the usual cause, warm environments, acute severe pain, fasting, 
crowded environments or anyone who faints at the sight of blood, the mechanisms are all the same and they are contributed to by this neurocardiogenic syncope mechanisms. Now, this kind of syncope is seen most commonly in young females and there is a prodrome associated with it in which there is nausea, lightheadedness, yawning, malaise and a lot of sweating or diaphoresis. This is followed by loss of consciousness, pallor and a low volume pulse and again sweating. If this persists for more than 30 to 60 seconds, then there can be clonic movements of the extremities along with urinary incontinence. What is the mechanism of neurocardiogenic syncope? Now, the main pathogenesis lies in this particular box. Strong myocardial contraction on an empty heart. This is the crux which leads to syncope in such situations. Now, as we've already seen, there are these various triggers which lead to neurocardiogenic syncope like hot environment, prolonged standing, emotional stress and dehydration. So, all of these lead to vasodilatation, reduced venous return and essentially lead to activate the baroreceptor. Now, we know that baroreceptors are stretch sensitive mechanoreceptors which are present in the carotid sinus and also in the aortic arch. So, they are activated at, relative, at lower pressures. So, they, they are a, a fast response mechanism which leads to immediate stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system whenever a relative drop in blood pressure is sensed by them. So, dehydration and all these stressors or triggers lead to the activation of the carotid sinus baroreceptor. Additionally, because of dehydration which leads to reduced venous, venous return, the LV cavity size is also reduced relatively. So, ultimately, the activation of this carotid sinus baroreceptor stimulates the sympathetic nervous system, which leads to a hyperdynamic contraction of this relatively empty heart. It is relatively empty because of this reduced venous return. So, this particular mechanism leads to stimulation of certain myocardial mechanoreceptors within the ventricle and that leads to a pan vagal response. A paradoxical vagal reflex is set in wherein there is a drop in both blood pressure as well as heart rate. So, there is vasodilatation which leads to a drop in blood pressure which is known as a vasodepressor response and also there is relative bradycardia also known as the cardioinhibitory response. After having understood the mechanisms behind neurocardiogenic syncope or vasovagal syncope, let's talk a bit about situational syncope which is quite similar to neurocardiogenic syncope. Situational syncope is essentially a reproducible vasovagal syncope but with a known precipitant. Now various situations like micturation, defecation, coughing, deglutition or weight lifting can precipitate situational syncope. The reflex is usually initiated by the receptors on visceral walls. Additionally, when there is strain, especially during defecation, coughing or weight lifting, there is additional reduced venous return. So all of that leads to a vasovagal response, a panvagal response leading to a drop in blood pressure and heart rate. Now here's an interesting bit of information called rock concert syncope. What is it? It was seen in the past that there were many articles published based on mass fainting episodes among rock concert audiences. I don't think any particular subgenre of rock music was to be blamed. It was seen amongst all kinds of audiences. So what was the mechanism behind these faintings? Number one, hyperventilation or panic attacks. Number two, sleeplessness the previous night, fasting from morning and prolonged standing in large queues. Number three, a lot of screaming, external compression of the thorax by masses which led to a Valsalva-like pressure which led to an impairment of venous return and a reduction of cardiac output. So all of these factors played a role in causing mass fainting during rock concerts. Now let's come to another type of neurally mediated syncope called carotid sinus hypersensitivity. Now there are essentially two subtypes. Number one is a spontaneous carotid sinus hypersensitivity and the second is the induced type. 
Now, the spontaneous one is not that common. It just occurs in around 1% of the population uh, who present with syncope. And it is seen in patients in which any situation which stimulates the carotid sinus, such as a head rotation, head extension, wearing a tight collar or shaving, leads to syncope. The second one is induced carotid sinus hypersensitivity in which patients usually come with unexplained syncope. There are no triggers as such. And you get an abnormal response which is induced during carotid sinus massage. What happens is there is an unveiling of a diseased AV node or a sinus node. So a marker of a diseased sinus or an AV node which cannot withstand inhibition is unveiled. So when you do a carotid sinus massage, you lead to a marked drop in the heart rate and the AV node or the sinus node which are not working well, which otherwise is not understood on a standard ECG is brought out by this sinus massage. So the car carotid sinus massage is like a stress test to unveil this conduction disease. How is carotid sinus hypersensitivity diagnosed? So uh, basically, how is a carotid sinus massage obtained and what are the various responses that you look for? So you put a firm pressure over each carotid bifurcation, remember not at the same time, one at a time, below the angle of the jaw for 10 seconds. Now a very important prerequisite before doing this carotid sinus massage is to auscultate the patient to make sure that there is no carotid brui. The presence of a brui is a contraindication to getting a carotid sinus massage. Now, if the carotid artery stenosis is very, very tight, remember there will not be any brui. Now, what is an abnormal response? An abnormal response can be either a vasodepressor response or a cardio inhibitory response or a mixed one. A vasodepressor response would be in the form of a drop in the systolic blood pressure of more than or equal to 50 millimeters of mercury. A cardio inhibitory response would be a pause of more than or equal to 3 seconds. Now this pause could be either a sinus pause or an AV block. And this cardio inhibitory response is, of, is more common than the vasodepressor response. Now, another example of a neurally mediated syncope is post-exertional syncope. So, in what conditions is this post-exertional syncope seen? Now, again, remember this is a form of vasovagal syncope or neurally mediated syncope. What happens is, after the exercise has stopped, after exercise cessation, the venous blood stops getting pumped back to the heart via the peripheral muscle contraction. However, the heart is still exposed to the catecholamine surge. So again, it hypercontracts on an empty cavity. Where have we heard that before? This is the crux behind neurocardiogenic syncope. And so that leads to a panvagal reflex. And this is very commonly seen in cases of hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy and aortic stenosis. Now these two conditions are especially susceptible to post-exertional syncope because of the small LV cavity because of left ventricular hypertrophy. So this small LV cavity is much less toler tolerable to this reduced preload and it is more likely to obliterate after exercise has stopped. Now let's come to orthostatic hypotension which is a very prevalent finding in clinical practice and it is very easy to miss it if you don't look out for it. So the question is in what age group is orthostatic hypotension commonly seen and what are the causes? So no question about it the elderly are the most affected and they are affected because of multiple causes which can be present in one patient leading to orthostatic hypotension. So one of the reasons could be an autonomic dysfunction either because of age itself or secondary to various factors like diabetes mellitus, uremia and Parkinson's disease. Second is volume depletion. The elderly are very much susceptible to volume depletion and they also tend to forget to take adequate water intake. Third is drugs which block the autonomic nervous system or which cause hypovolemia. For example, vasodilators, beta blockers, diuretics and alcohol. 
what is the mechanism of orthostatic hypotension? Now, we are aware of the basic equation wherein the blood pressure is equal to cardiac output into vascular resistance and the cardiac output in turn is equal to stroke volume into heart rate. Now, orthostatic hypotension is basically associated with autonomic failure in which there is a lack of compensatory increase in the vascular resistance or the heart rate upon standing up that is upon orthostasis. As a result, there is significant hypovolumia which cannot be overcome by the sympathetic activation and that leads to a drop in blood pressure. So, the drop in systolic blood pressure is more than or equal to 20 millimeters of mercury or a drop in the diastolic blood pressure is more than or equal to 10 millimeters of mercury after 30 seconds to 5 minutes of standing. Now, usually it is measured at 3 minutes after standing. Now, there is something known as initial orthostatic hypotension in which there is an immediate drop of blood pressure but it recovers in 30 seconds. So, at 3 minutes which is when you usually look for the blood pressure, it is normalized. So, it is always better to check the blood pressure immediately on standing and also after 3 minutes. There is also something known as mild orthostatic hypotension in which a delayed response occurs in which there is a delayed hypotension after 10 to 15 minutes as blood slowly pools in the periphery. How is postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome different from orthostatic hypotension? Now, in postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, also known as POTS, there is orthostatic failure, that is, there is autonomic dysfunction, but it only affects the peripheral vascular resistance that is only this component is affected. The heart is spared that is the heart rate increases in response to standing. So, as a result the cardiac output and the blood pressure remains intact because of this compensatory rise in heart rate in response to a drop in the peripheral vascular resistance. So, what happens is there is an increase in the heart rate of more than 30 beats per minute in the first 10 minutes of standing or an absolute increase in the heart rate of more than 120 beats per minute. So, this is what is commonly seen. There is also a component of POTS known as hyperadrenergic POTS in which there is no such autonomic nervous system failure that is vascular resistance is not affected, it is just that the sympathetic nervous system is overly activated. This however is quite rare as compared to the common type of postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. What are the cardiac mechanisms of syncope? Now remember after neurally mediated syncope, cardiac causes are the second most common cause of syncope. You will have to watch part 2 of the video on syncope to know about this. As always like, share, subscribe and comment and press the bell icon and I will see you next time with another video.